This is the Women's Hockey Life Podcast. Welcome to the Women's Hockey Life Podcast, empowering women and girls in hockey. We have an absolute rock star legend joining us for today's episode. She's a three-time Olympian. She spent 15 years in the national program, a former UNH Wildcat, coached at the NCAA Division I level with Merrimack College. She's played in the PWHPA, and I was even fortunate enough to call her a teammate playing with the Boston Blades for the CWHL. As skilled as she is on the ice, she's an even better person off. She would literally give you the shirt off her back if you needed it. And she can throw down donuts like no one I've ever known. So it's only fitting that she wore the number 22, and today's episode happens to be episode number 22. She is Casey Bellamy. Welcome to the show. How are you? I'm great. How are you? Doing well. You know, it's it's nice and cold up here in Ottawa, but uh, that's what our winters are like, you know? Oh my gosh. We're getting a big nor'easter here this weekend. I think they say like 23 to 30 inches. So, oh wow. We're preparing. Okay. okay. We got crushed with about two feet in one day. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I guess it was, I don't even know when, I don't even know what today is to be honest. Yeah, <laughs> I know. There's but been it's a always fun. Yeah. 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 Good stuff. Good stuff. Well, I had to make the comment about the donuts because I remember my first year on the team with the blades in between periods, looking over at you and I swear you were crushing a donut. And I'm like, I love this girl. I'm like, we are going to be friends. And yeah. still, like that was it. You, you just love donuts, eh? Oh, such a passion. Like I'm not like a sweets person, but when it comes to pastries, donuts, it's just, I think growing up, we would get like the dozen Dunkin' Donuts and it's just something I always used as, okay, this is my treat after like a camp or a big game or a tournament. You've got to reward yourself, right? Yep. You have to do it in donuts. Is, is there a go-to for you? Um, you know, Dunkin' Donuts, the coffee rolls. So it's like the big swirl with the cinnamon in the middle with the frosting. It's the best. Solid choice. Right. I approve. I approve. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. So Olympics are just around the corner, a few days away from that. Um, I'm going to dive right in and, and, and ask the big question, you know, now that you're retired, any second thoughts, any regrets with watching your, your former teammates getting ready to suit up here? No, to be honest, I'm loving watching the social media, watching the girls put their clothes on. And you know why? Because there's so many rookies that are going and experiencing it for the first time. And I remember my first time, my second time, my third time, it didn't matter. Every single time you do that type of stuff, it's so exciting. Pictures and the memories with the teammates and the laughs. No regrets whatsoever. I'm just so happy and uh, rooting for the girls. So it's d- different being on this side, but way more comfortable and calm for sure. Oh, I bet. I bet the nerves aren't as bad. It's it's secondhand jitters now, right? You're getting that parent experience of watching their kids. It's like you're watching your sisters play now, right? Oh my gosh, for for sure. And my mom, like, obviously, if anyone knew my mom, like, she die hard. She still wants me to still go to this Olympics, like, wants me to get on a plane right now and go. I'm like, mom, my time's up. (laughs) I had a pretty good career, mom. I think I'm good. I got moving on (laughs) to the next chapter, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's been it's been a great kind of journey from my retirement, just seeing this side of life and it's having your weekends. There's nothing like it. I mean, obviously it's different. I miss the ice. I miss the competition. That was why I stayed in it for so long, but I was ready to move on with my next chapter and it's been nothing but wonderful. That's awesome. I love to hear that. You mentioned, you know, just your, you remember your first time, like it was a second or third, obviously Austria and Denmark first time competing, qualifying for the Olympics. Take us back. Number one, to your first Olympics in Vancouver, 2010. Um, and what do you remember feeling, thinking, do you even remember it? Is it all kind of a blur right now? Oh, man, that was probably my favorite Olympics. So I remember it very um, clearly. I, I think the biggest thing was um, seeing all the NHL guys. That was really cool. That was something that I remember. And just like being in Vancouver, the village was on the water. Um, the opening ceremonies was un unbelievable I saw my parents like up in the rafters and I like bawled and it was just a moment of everything coming together and just it just such a special moment for me and my family and my teammates that I'll never forget Vancouver with a lot of my best friends that I played with putting on the USA jersey and just being able to share it with family and friends because Vancouver was obviously more accessible to get to um, for family. Yeah, true. Right. It's just a uh, same continent, at least not, yeah, like, exactly. not like this one for sure. Right. So you mentioned just even being able to say NHL, see NHL players, other like professional athletes, were you guys able to interact with them at all? 
Yeah. Uh, when you go into the cafeteria, I mean, all the athletes from all the different countries, depending if what sports you're playing, they're all there. So you're getting to see like Chara, we walk by Crosby, like, cause all the hockey guys and girls are in one place. And then you have all the skiers that were up in Whistler, um, in a different village, but it was, it was so unique and the village was incredibly put together and it, it was just a um olympics i'll never forget and when we went back to vancouver last two years ago right before covid it was so special to be back there and it was like kind of that 10 years since we've been back so it was really special that's awesome that's cool you can just kind of interact in the, in the dining halls it's like being back at berkshire prep school right you just everyone's in the same same cafeteria same spot and you you mingle oh, with good it, people right it's great people watching at the olympics it's the best <laughs> I can only imagine. And was, was Chris Tang your, your favorite player? Was oh yeah. That- still as my favorite player. <laughs> yeah. I don't think he made an Olympics, but I, I, and I think I really started liking him around like that time. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, but love him. I met him a few times once in Montreal and then, uh, once at the all-star weekend uh, a few years ago when we did the three on three. Were you calm, cool, collected, or were you like freaking out inside? Well, you know what? I was like, I'm going to go ask him for a picture. He's with his son, though, and I would love to get a picture with his son, too. And then I went up to him, and he remembered kind of meeting at that place in Montreal, so I felt kind of a little special. <laughs> you remember me. <laughs> I think he just knows I'm obsessed with him, and I'm also a player, but I play for Team USA, and he's obviously yeah. Canadian, but it's fine. <laughs> I love that freaking out. Eh? That's how people feel when they meet you, right? No, no, no. 100%. I've seen it firsthand. And, and I'm ho- uh, hoping the little girls do. And of boys, they will. of course they will. So, so for those players, even on like Austria, Denmark, or anybody on any of the teams, this is their first Olympics. What, what kind of advice could you give them? Oh, honestly, just take in every moment you can, like, don't get too excited, but at the same time, you can't say that because it's their first Olympics feel however, the way you want to feel. It's just when you step on the ice, just understand it. it's just a game and just go out there and play the game. Like, you know how to play and conserve your energy throughout the Olympics. But honestly, opening ceremonies, team processing, getting all the clothes, go nuts and just be the happiest because you'll never forget that moment. That's awesome. Social media is a little different than uh, 2010 though, eh? (laughs) Yeah, no Instagram back in 2010. Twitter just started, but now it's, it's amazing to be able to see everything and you can just follow along so easily. So that's, it's special. I know it really is, even though we're time zones away and everything else, it's I'm pumped. Like it's literally days away here and it's, it's, I don't know what's going to happen. I know it'll be interesting for sure. And I think the three games that just got canceled between the U S and Canada, that really tough because of COVID, but I think it's even going to make it more exciting when um, those two face off again and just to, you know, see the final. And I can't wait to see all the parody in women's hockey. And, you know, sometimes I hope there's an upset. I think it's good for the game. I think everybody kind of always hopes for that. Cause like you said, it's good for the game. It's growing. Yeah. Teams are getting better. It's more competitive, right? Yeah. It's amazing. It's what you can hope for, but okay. So you're now moved on. You were with Maple's crossing, correct? Mm-hmm. Yep. What, what was that transition like for you from going from elite athlete Olympian to, Hey, you're in your office right now. Yeah. The transition, it kind of worked out. Awesome. I mean, after I decided to retire, I kind of have been in talks with um, the Maples Crossing organization and the the business that I do work for global properties. Um, Joe Callahan, Trevor Smith, both played in the NHL. They Trevor went to UNH with me. Um, so I didn't really know them. But now over the time, they're just unbelievable human beings. And we have all the same visions of taking the lessons that we learned in hockey and incorporating them in these kids at a young age and hopefully, you know, make their future development better than we had when we were younger. Awesome. Just giving back to the game, right? Yeah. And that's what it's all about. And I think for me, I'm pretty competitive and the youth is a great chance for me to just show them what it takes to be an elite athlete, but at the same time, do it in a way that is very welcoming and understanding for kids at that age. Um, you just want to make a difference in their lives. Of course, you're, you are mm. very competitive. You're probably not letting them win any one-on-one battles, eh? No, I need to work. <laughs> I need to work on that, but no, I don't like losing. <laughs> I don't care if you're seven years old, I'm going to beat you. Yes. 
it is what it is. So, so tell people who don't know about Maple's Crossing, like what is a day-to-day thing for you? What are you guys doing, um, hoping to do in the future? Yeah, we, um, so all in all, it's going to be a big lifestyle slash athletic complex. The goal is to five rinks, uh, turf field, hotels, restaurants, um, all sports around the area right now, we're opening the YMCA early learning center, which is for daycare from six months to six years old. And then hopefully they move their way up the campus and do their youth development all the way up until high school and beyond. We're hoping to have just an incredible amount of participation here, adult leagues, learn to play all different sports. And we want it to be kind of the hub of hockey. And that's just something that the Callahan's and global thought about doing and um, the owner, Steve, he's close to retirement. So this is kind of his legacy project. And I'm just absolutely honored that they chose me to kind of head up the athletic development. And it's been wonderful. That's amazing. It sounds like a dream job, to be honest. It is right now. It's very in the beginning because as you like the turf field is not even out yet. It's being built, but it's beginning stages. And that's why I I didn't want to come into it when it was already built because who does that? I wanted to see it through from the beginning to end. And that was also like a a big decision in my retirement, me being ready to move on with the next chapter, but I wanted to do it in a way of, okay, now this is my next team and I want to see it through from beginning to end. That's awesome. That's awesome. So talk, talk to us about the retirement process. You just said, you know, you, you knew what you wanted to get into going through that transition and everything. Was it a hard decision for you or were you like, all right, I've, I've done everything that I've wanted to do. I've accomplished everything. I'm ready. Or was it more having tough conversations going back and forth? You know what I mean? Yeah. The only tough conversation was with my mother, but um, (laughs) for me, it was easy. Uh, I thought about it from after 2018. Um, I made the decision to move to Calgary and that saved me a year because I fell in love with the sport in a totally different way. When I moved there, I played with different girls, Canadians, rivals, and met so many new people. Um, And then I think when COVID hit and things were just like, okay, enough's enough. Like you're training and when you're female and you don't get the resources and support, like the professional male um, hockey players do, it's tough. And when it came down to it, my body was not holding up the way it was like in 2018. And to be honest, I, I knew I was ready to move on. And when I'm thinking more so about, uh, okay, I think I'm ready to retire soon more than I'm excited to get back on the ice. Then I knew that the decision was, okay, let's really think about this and, you know, discuss it with, you know, your family and friends, but deep down it's, it's your own personal decision. And I knew that in my heart, it was the right one. And one of the other main reasons is honestly, the girls that are trying out for the team and have been to camps and tournaments and never really made that senior team. Some of those girls are on the Olympic team right now. And to see them reach their dream after years and years of preparation and work and not quite getting there, but are there now it's makes me really happy in my heart to see. That's amazing. That's amazing. You're you're very humble and you're very uh, selfless. I can tell just, I'm, I mean, I know you, but the conversation too, and you've always been a great leader as well. Thank you. Right. Thank and you. I mean, you've, you've worn the letters and everything else, but I got to ask you in your opinion, because you are a great leader. What do you think makes a great leader? Honestly, waking up in the morning to get better, no matter what you're doing and doing it in such a humble way and having a quiet confidence in it and just making sure that you're bettering everyone else around you and being a great influence for everyone else around you. Um, I learned a lot as a leader throughout my career. I think I have learned to be more empathetic towards people because I am pretty competitive. I am pretty stern. I'm pretty black and white. And I think over my years, I, I ha- I've had to turn a little more gray and just, like I said, be more empathetic to listening and people respect you more when you're welcoming and you can, they can come to you and talk. I think I, I was an intimidated person slash player for people. And I think just learning that over the years and changing my leadership um, habits has been incredible. You've got a teddy bear side to you. 
I, I sometimes do with a few drinks to me for sure. <laughs> Who doesn't, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> That's awesome. So, I mean, for those who don't know, like Casey went to Berkshire prep school um, in Massachusetts and did that experience help or define your career or what you wanted to do? Like, I guess what I'm trying to ask is when did you know that I want to be an Olympian? Yeah. Berkshire, I think had one of the biggest influences on my life. And if I gave any player advice, I would definitely say go the prep school route just because I know it's different nowadays. And junior is one of the most popular things to do in the right Avenue, but what you learn besides like getting better in your sport is just how to become a disciplined time management, um, leadership, socialization. There's so many things you learn about life in prep school that sport does teach you, but to a different degree. And you learn about yourself because you're living away from home in a dorm. You're finding your true self And it's just an amazing atmosphere to be around. And if it wasn't for those lessons that I learned from the teachers, their advisors, coaches, I would not be the person that I am today. It's so true. Mm -hmm. Prep school is just a whole other beast. And and obviously, like you said, there's many different paths you can go to get to college, but that it's the personal growth piece that it makes a prep school unique, right? Like, absolutely. I'm sure you had maybe teammates or definitely friends around campus that were from different countries even. Yeah, totally. My roommate had um, a girl from Asia that she lived with and we became best friends. And that's the best part. You don't always have to be hanging out with the hockey players or the sport that you're playing. But some of my best friends didn't even play sports in at Berkshire. So it was amazing. And you just you get that different kind of you get that those different friendships that you never think that you're going to have because you're you're thinking you're only going to have hockey players as friends. But when you go to prep school, there's so much diversity that it's incredible. The people and personalities that you meet. hundred percent. Now, uh, when you travel the world, you can uh, bunk up and your friends who are from all over the world, right. That you've met. Yeah, exactly. And that's, what's nice when you travel, you know, you kind of know someone around the area. Yeah. They can show you the ropes and uh, what's, what's happening in that city and what's not. Right. I love that. So let's transition to, to university. So you go from Berkshire, you commit to UNH. Um, I feel like the game that we played against you when I was at UConn was when you broke your leg, not to bring up a a sore subject, but let's backtrack though into what was the recruiting process like for you? Yeah, the recruiting process was interesting. I didn't want to go Midwest. I wanted to stay around the East coast because my family, I wanted them to see games. I wanted to be able to go home. So I definitely stayed around hockey East and ECAC. I narrowed it down to St. Lawrence, Providence and UNH. And to be honest, UNH was at last on my list because I went there and the coach was sitting in his office and I came and he didn't even come out and say hi to me. So I was very offended. Um, But now that I know the coaching world, I wasn't a big deal like recruit at all. So I understand. But at the same time, if there's someone coming to visit, like I would go out there and, you know, shake their hand and say hi to them. Um, but Providence was closer to my other side of the family in Rhode Island. And then St. Lawrence, I loved so much because a lot of my Berkshire friends and teammates were there. But great rank not- too. Yeah, great rank, really. Um, I loved that we went and played there actually, but five hours from my parents, what in the middle of nowhere, one of my best friends, Carson Duggan went there and she had the most unbelievable time, but I I needed my parents to come to games and my brother Rob was at the university of Maine at the time. And I knew that it would be easier for my parents to juggle watching both of us play throughout our college careers. So I went to UNH. That's awesome. You guys went to the frozen four a couple of times too, right? Yep. To twice uh, my freshman junior year. Wow. No big deal. But we didn't get past the first game. So that's sad. (laughs) You made it further than a lot of different other people. So I, uh, I'd still say it's a pretty good career for For sure. sure. So when you then went from obviously university playing pro national team, you then went back to Merrimack college, not back to, you went to Merrimack college to coach. What made you want to coach? Well, to be honest, I, I knew maybe after um, hockey, I wanted to get into coaching. So I wanted that experience. Aaron Witten became the head coach who was my assistant at UNH. So it kind of worked out real nice. And she asked if I would be willing, if I wanted to coach 
to be honest, we weren't making any money at the time. We were making like $1,500 from the United States Olympic Committee, and that was all the income we had. Um, and then the NWHL came out that year. So we started getting paid, and then I was coaching. So it was nice to get a little bit of money that year, but at the same time, my I had no free time. Um, but it was a great experience. I loved the girls. Um, I had a great mentor in Brent uh, Hill, my other assistant coach that I lived with, and uh, we'll be friends forever. And it was just a great decision that, and I'm glad I did it. That's awesome. Do you think that you becoming a collegiate coach, did it help your game personally? Like, did you see the game from a different perspective now that you were standing behind the bench? Yeah, I would say definitely helped my game in ways of, okay, you can see a player doing this and they are rushing the pocket, but they have so much more time, but only you can see that from the bench. And I think that it really helped me hone in on my abilities, but it also matured me. And that was the most important thing, I think, in that stage of my career. I wasn't playing, like there were times when I was playing Canada with USA Hockey and I was sitting those games. Um, we had a new coach and I was just, it was mentally a really tough time for me. I actually thought about retiring then because I was like, ah, oh, they look at me as like the seventh D, like I, I want to be there. I'm being a great teammate and supporting them, but like maybe my time's up. Um, and then a new coaching change happened and um, I started playing more and um I don't know. Things just happened where I was talking to my mental skills coach. I was really having tough years and Merrimack, I think just helped mature and helped me grow in ways to be a better leader and to even become a little more humble and understand the, the game of hockey on and off the ice more. Yeah, no, for sure. For sure. And it's tough when you get all those minutes and then all of a sudden you're not getting as much. And like you said, you questioned retiring or not playing anymore. So like what made you stay? what, what like, had you pushed through that adversity? How did you do that? Yeah. I remember, um, it was winter camp 2000 and fifth, maybe 2015 going or 16 right in December. So I told my dad, I go, I don't think I'm going to go to camp. I think I'm going to deny the invitation from USA hockey. And I'm in like my, what, like seventh year now. And he goes, okay. Cause he understood all what I was going through. Like it, it, you know, it's tough, but at the same time, like I was always trying to be the best teammate I could be, but it comes to a point where it's like, okay, well, if they don't see me in the future, like, you know, my dad said, just go to camp, you know, just go to camp and try to have fun. And if you're at the end of the camp and you still feel the same way, then, then, you know, you're done. I went and had a great camp and, um, I didn't even think about playing or not playing or my role in the team. I just went and enjoyed time with my teammates and had a blast. And from kind of then on it, it's changed and I started playing more and then we got a new coach and um, then we went to the Olympics the next year. Wow. So yeah. you just went out and had fun like you did as a kid. Exactly. And from that day on, I remember like that was all I was going to be focused on staying positive, not thinking about mistakes, not thinking about negativity just focus on fun and smiling and working hard, but you can do all that and have a good attitude and have fun doing it. Absolutely. The mindset piece of it, right? That's all it is. It's to me, it's all mental. If I'm doubting myself 1%, I'm not, I'm not going to be successful. Team's not going to be successful. You know, it's, you learn so much throughout your career with the mental side of things, mental skills, people roll their eyes and they maybe not understand it, but if you can really teach someone and they, they get the mental aspect of it and they know how to come back from a mistake and just let things go and not dwell on too, too many things during the game on and off the ice, then it's your golden. If you're, if you have a great mental or mentality, then you're going to be successful. Let's dive into this a little bit more because the, the mental side of the game is obviously what I'm fascinated by and, and growing up never really had a mentor or a sports psychologist or a mindset coach or anything like that, but subconsciously I was aware of it, but didn't know what I was doing until mm -hmm. you learned about it later. Right. So what, what do you think, you know, like young kids, young girls, young players could do at a young age to start building that? You know what I mean? Like, honestly, is yeah, it's totally. Like when I started with the national team, it's kind of where I was first introduced to mental skills. I think when we're younger and 
I think a lot of us like visualize the game, like before bed, when you have a big game, you're going to think about what I'm going to do good, what I'm going to do bad. I think for me, I always dwelled on my mistakes and my errors. And I was so hard on myself and I expected perfection. I think for me, understanding the difference of, yes, learn from your mistakes, be hard on yourself when you're not playing well, but let it go and come up with different exercises that you can do subconsciously or consciously on the bench in the locker room. So by the time I was at my, the end of my career, I would sit at the blue line during the anthem and do this breathing technique because, you know, you're so amped before the game, but these little breathing things, deep breaths, it naturally calms you. And just doing that, it'll keep you mentally focused and ready for puck drop. And then say you make a mistake during the game, I would always, just, okay, come spray the water bottle, spray it. And that was it. That was my mental trigger of, okay, move on next shift. And it's just, you know, yourself, you find your strengths, you find your weaknesses and you work on improving them and educating yourself on how to do that. If it's important to you. Which it should be, I think for any athlete in general, but it's, it's having that, like that physical trigger, right. For you squirt the water bottle, maybe someone sliding down the bench or I don't know, there's something, a physical trigger and then a mental trigger to follow it. Right. Right. Information, something just snap out of it and be like, all right. Hockey is literally a game of mistakes. Like it is going to happen. Right. Yeah. But like, how funny is it? Say you like make two good plays and then you make a bad play. You're not dwelling on the bad play because you're, you're feeling good, but say you make like three bad plays in a row and then one maybe good play, but then another bad play. You're just, it's the momentum and you just have to figure it out. And obviously there's games where you just can't seem to keep the puck on your stick or you're losing it or and then you've got to figure out a different part of your game that you can excel at if one isn't going well. And that's what I would try to do. If my legs weren't there that day, then I would say, okay, you got to move the puck faster then. And you have to already know what you're doing with the puck. If your legs aren't feeling good, little things. Yep. And I think that that's key. What you just said is that find the small things that, you know, you're good at and execute on those. Because if I don't know, you you're on the ice, you turn the puck over, they go down and score. Are you now thinking, oh crap, I got to get, I got to go score school. I have to score the goal. It's got to be me, right. right? That's too much pressure. That's, that's a high expectation. It's like, no, keep it simple, small things, one at a time, good breakout yeah. passes, whatever it may be, get the puck deep. Um, but I think some people lose sight of that. So I'm just, I'm more or less hitting on this for any of those young girls listening right now with like, don't put the world or the weight of the world on your shoulder, right? Just execute on the small things, build the confidence, and then your game will turn around essentially. Right. I love that. I love that. Just focus on the first pass and then it'll kind of have a domino effect. If you just focus on the small things, not the big ones. That's momentum, right? That's how it builds. You've been in enough games where it's like going your way. And then all of a sudden it turns and you're like, Ooh, back on your heels. Right. Yep. I had a puck go off my leg during a gold medal game and maybe in the Olympics. (laughs) I wasn't going to bring that up. (laughs) I know, but stuff happens, right? That's just it. You can score in your own net, but that's just how uh, flukes happen. And like we said, that's the game of hockey. Exactly. I love it. I love it. All right. So any, any advice in general or specifically that you can give to hockey players, young and old who are chasing their dreams, whether it's to be in the Olympics, college prep school, be the best beer league goalie ever. Um, Any advice on how to achieve that, how to accomplish your goals, your dreams? Definitely for me, I would just say, love what you do. You have to love it. And because that is going to be the single motivating factor for you to wake up every single day and keep getting better. So you have to love it. And if you love it and you want to get to the highest level, you have to work your butt off. So no matter what you do, you have to be the hardest worker on the ice. And that has to be your mindset every time you go into the rink, go into the ice. But as a young kid, don't, don't obsess over the game enjoy your summers. Don't be on the ice 12 months a year, like have your year playing hockey play for one or two teams. Like don't go crazy and playing for all these teams going all these showcases, just enjoy the process. And in the summer, take time, do other sports. I think that was the most important thing for my success was playing other sports. Multi-sport athlete. It, yep. It, it translates on the ice. It does. It absolutely does. Who's winning the Olympics? Oh, that's so tough because 
if you ask me, I feel like Canada had the upper leg, but I think USA started to find their groove a little more. It would be nice to see a little upset though, for sure. <laughs> I hear you. Well, we'll all be tuning in for it. And uh, Bells, thanks so much for, for doing this with us today. I appreciate it. And it sounds like you're crushing it in uh, the next chapter of your life. And we're, we're proud of you. We're grateful for all that you've done for the game and we'll continue to do. Thanks, Hawk. I appreciate it. And very proud of you for everything that you've been doing. Thank you. Appreciate that as well. You're welcome. Thank you guys for tuning in. Until next time, I'm going to steal a quote from my friend here, Gacy. Work hard, stay humble, and be kind. Yeah.